Yes, I, I, yeah, crypto is a very um, a nebulous thing, right? And but but the underlying technology, blockchain, the distributed ledger, the distributed ledger, as a blockchain, that's the true technology that has far reaching implications on the future of, of what can be done in all kinds of different industries. And welcome to a new episode of Digital Coffee Marketing Brew. And I'm your host, Brett Deister. And this week, we're going to be talking about digital transformation, because I feel like we're transforming a little bit more than usual before. We first had the smartphones, but now we have AI and all the other fun stuff. And the a Apple Vision Pro was recently announced. So it's going to be interesting to talk about that with marketing business and everything. But with me, I have Craig with me, and he is... A successful entrepreneur. He has the foresight to start a digital first company way back when, when that was the talk of the town. Now, I feel like most companies are mostly on that digital first thing, but he also has been utilizing the internet for digital transformation as well. And he's just he's just a great host to have. He's done a lot of different things with a lot of different company, and he's also have been really successful with just a limited budget, which all small businesses and small marketing teams need to understand to be pivotal and pivot on where you need to actually go on this. But he's just started, a, he had a company called rhythm.net.com with just started with a couple of different friends. He also had a world-class digital creative agency with multitude of awards within Orange County, as well as I saw. So just welcome to the show, Craig. Uh, thank you, Brett. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and uh, happy to share. Yeah, and the first question is all my guests is, are you a coffee or tea drinker? Oh, you know, I never drank coffee till I was about 30 years old. I always loved tea. And then I became addicted to coffee. And I, I drink both these days. But um, yeah, like right now, I have my coffee with me. So <laughs> yeah, I was a late bloomer, too. I didn't start until like 25 ish. So I was quite a late bloomer as you. So like, what is your go to brew? Do you like the lights, mediums, darks? Do you like the flavored coffee? Do you just put a whole bunch of sugar and, and cream just to make it taste better for you? Well, when I first started drinking coffee at 30, it was uh, Starbucks lattes that kind of got me hooked. But over the course of time, um, yeah, probably for like the past I don't know, 10 years at least. It's just been black coffee, non-flavored, uh, different blends, dark roast. Um, this is my preference. Uh, but what I've been doing lately, my kind of go-to now, uh, because I've you know cut back on coffee to a certain degree, at least so, you know, because coffee has benefits. But I do this um this uh cacao, roasted cacao, which you make just like coffee. And I'll do like a 50-50 mix of this roasted cacao blend with coffee. And so um, it's a nice, nice uh, uh, blend. And I throw in this um, uh, shilaji, which is kind of it's kind of like a, how do I describe it? It's this black tarry stuff, and it's really bitter <laughs> and earthy, but it's super good for you. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's different. <laughs> That's my daily brew. Uh, is it like dark chocolate bitter? Because I cannot do dark chocolate bitter. Uh, yeah, it's like that, but even more earthy and bitter. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird. But, you know, uh, and I'll throw some cinnamon in it too, just because. Um, but then there'll be times where I just do my black coffee. But, you know, just. Oh, uh, all right, more power. A little bit more <laughs> of like like doing all this different stuff. I just do it black. <laughs> That's it. And I, yeah. I, I only do light medium because dark rose actually has less caffeine for those that mm -hmm. don't know. Light yep. medium have more dark rose has mm -hmm. less. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And I, I like dark roast, just plain, like some, there'll be time like this weekend. I just had dark roast, black coffee. It was great. <laughs> nice. Good stuff. So I gave, I have a brief it, summary of your expertise. Can you give our guests a little bit more about what you do? our listeners uh, absolutely so i started a as you mentioned a digital first company but way back in the 20th century 1996 before that was ever a term uh you know that really didn't become a term until probably like 10 years ago or something like that right and uh we were doing digital transformation work uh back then again before that was ever a term and uh small 
business, started out with a couple of friends, just $1,300 a piece in a computer. So re really limited resources. Uh, we started marketing independent music online and struggled with that concept for a couple of years. It's just an idea before it's time. You know, people could discover new artists and listen to song samples and buy their CDs online through a secure server way back in 1996. But, um, you know, there's no MP3s, no broadband and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, after a couple of years, we pivoted, just like you mentioned, the importance of pivoting, uh, put the music thing to the side and then really started to focus on web design for companies because we started getting a bunch of requests. Uh, and we said, sure, yeah, we'll do that. And then it's like the light bulb moment. Well, let's let's switch gears. And then at that time, I saw a vision for the future of how an advertising agency would um, evolve. And that is really being able to produce communications in an offline and online world and eventually kind of combine the two bridge the gap. So just start working to build out that model. And over the course of time, built up a lot of different competencies like email marketing, search marketing, digital video production, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, grew the agency, was on the Inc. 5000 list five years in a row. Uh, best places to work, top places to work four years in a row. Um, yeah, a lot of awards, great stuff, great journey. Eventually sold it in 2019 to a world-class digital creative agency based out of New York City. And then stayed on. Um, as my role as CEO for three more years. And then um, here I am today in a whole new chapter in life and uh, doing consulting work. And I just released a book, uh, Business Kung Fu. I just released that a few months ago. And yeah, that's, that's um, it's a whole new chapter. Gotcha. And so like digital transformation was, well, it, it feels like most businesses are already somewhat there or there everybody every business has a website everybody's using email everybody has their email newsletters but what's the next evolution of it because i feel like we had what in 1996 the actual internet because that's when actually when it was kind of brought out to the masses for the most part then we had like every company needed a website and then smartphones was the next kind of evolution because then you could work while you're on the go and you didn't have to sit at an actual computer or laptop but I think now it's like more just the AI is the next digital transformation that businesses are going to have to figure out how to actually use effectively. Am I right about that? Yes, I, I would agree with that. Absolutely. You know, we've gone through these various evolutions of digital transformation in the beginning when uh, first started. Yeah, it was like this brochure where you get a website for your company. It was very informational, you know, not much functionality. Then, um, you know, five years later, you really started getting a lot of database applications being built, web applications being built, where you got a, a lot of utility, functional utility out of an online experience. So that was like a, another step in the evolution. And then um, after that, I've got to rewind my mind here. Yes, uh, the mobile phones came out. So now we were on the go utilizing the internet as wherever we went. And then right around that same time, social media started to become really prevalent and that was a whole another aspect. And it really evolved to where you couldn't just rely on one thing. You really needed an integrated solution, which was our thinking way back in the day anyways, before all this stuff was coming to place. But um, now uh, with the advent of AI, yeah, what can be done that in a highly efficient manner, uh, utilizing tools, uh, AI tools to create better val more value through better products in a more efficient manner right and it's really about leveraging the tools and yeah maybe there'll be some job displacement and so forth but it'll really be the people that embrace those tools that'll thrive because it's just like i, I draw the analogy of when desktop publishing first came out in late 80s or whenever it was where you had a lot of people doing the traditional paste up and typesetting etc and then the Macintosh came in and with its like Illustrator and Photoshop and Quark Express and all that and how you can do things with the computer. And a lot of people didn't embrace that. Well, they got displaced and the people that embraced that technology, they're the ones that thrived for the next 10 years and beyond uh, doing that type of work. So it's, uh, it's the same thing. We're at this big evolution. I also think too, with this uh, blend of, offline and online and how it comes together, you know, that's going to continue as well. 
So, I mean, how are marketers supposed to pivot? Because it's going to be a pivot for them. Because a lot of them are probably, there's going to be some senior ones, middle management, and then the new ones. Obviously, the the Gen Z and Gen Alpha and all that are going to be fine with it because usually younger people have an easier time using new technologies. Not saying that old people can't do it either, but usually it's the younger generation pushing the new technology onto businesses. So how can the middle managers and the senior executives actually like figure this out to use it well? Cause you have jet GPT Gemini, which was formerly barred for Google. You have Gronk, which is Twitter AI or X you have perplexity Claude. You have a bunch of them. And I've just named like five of them. I'm pretty sure there's another 15 of them that I don't even know about. So how could they, like effectively get their employees to experiment with it for now. Cause I'm pretty sure experimenting is fine and businesses always move slow with new technology, but how can you get them to experiment with this? Yeah. So um, that's, that's a key experimentation and there's businesses of all different sizes and types, right? So you have say your owners or, or managers, middle, even middle managers, or say large organizations, you know, there's more slow to adopt, slow to move because of the size, right? Um, I think in organizations like that, you have to really rely on your team to do the research and development. You know, they should always be having um, the leaders that they supervise or whatever, however many levels there are, that whoever is under them, their direct reports, that they allocate time for them to research and development on whatever products and services that they're producing, right? Like how, how what's, what's emerging, what is what are trends, um, for companies that are smaller in size, small businesses, then it's going to be really up to, uh, I believe the founder or the owner to do some direct research and development and make some determinations as to, uh, what could bring value to the, their environment and then allocate time for uh, their team to get up to speed based on whatever has been selected. And I, that, for example, I know this one gentleman, uh, for the past year, he's been diving deep into the world of AI and he knew as a traditional brand and uh, consumer packaged good uh, designer. And he has a small team and he's been in business for like, I don't know, 25 years or longer. And they've they've dive, dove deep into AI, but he was the one that really initiated it, did the research, started experimenting, and then he's been allocating time for his team members based on his direction to really take a dive, deep dive. And now they're they're doing some really interesting things that are that are really super cool, actually. I mean, I know like. In 2022, at least the beginning, and maybe 2021 and 2020, like Web3 was the thing. It was like Web3, crypto, NFTs, like all that stuff. And then all of a sudden, AI came out and it's crypto, NFTs. Well, obviously, the, the industry crushed. Like it went, it catered so hard because and crypto was not doing well, well during the pandemic at all. And NFTs just cratered hard too. Like a lot of the multi-million dollar purchases were worthless now. So are we seeing the new evolution of Web3 to be AI and blockchain instead of crypto and NFTs? Because I feel like AI and blockchain is more of a compelling and easier to explain than crypto and NFTs were. NFTs and cryptos are still hard to explain. They've never had a good marketing message around it where businesses are like i don't know how to use this but ai i understand how to use yes i i yeah crypto is a very um it's a nebulous thing right and but but the underlying technology blockchain the distributed ledger the distributed ledger as a blockchain that's the true technology that has far reaching implications on the future of, of what can be done in all kinds of different industries, right? You know, crypto is just one component of that. And um, the convergence of AI with blockchain technology, yes, I agree. There's definitely going to be some things that happen that are going to be extremely big. There are companies out there that are uh, AI-driven blockchains, uh, that'll be interesting to see where how things develop and how quickly crypto is. Um, yeah, you know, we have the Bitcoin having coming up here probably in about two to three months. 
most likely uh, based on his historical performance that is going to uh, create a big um, interest in crypto again because the price and the values are going to be skyrocketing most likely you know not guaranteed but most likely uh, because it's got uh, bitcoin itself is going to become uh, more scarce because it's going to be harder to mine and produce more bitcoin so scarcity whenever you have scarcity um, the value increases you know just the simple law of supply and demand uh, so I think crypto is going to see a big resurgence over the next 18 months. Uh, but the blockchain technology itself is going to continue to find new roads and the convergence of AI and, and blockchain is going to be extremely interesting. So how can businesses prepare for this? They don't have to do it now, but I feel like they need to prepare for eventual blockchain and eventual AI to basically utilized in most, if not all of their tools, but that's like a five to 10 year process right now. But how can they prepare to do this transformation into it? Because transformation is, to me, it feels it's more like a slow process. No one ever does anything that quickly. I mean, we, we all have different areas where we will do some things quickly and other things not so quickly. So how can businesses start to prepare for this because eventually they're going to have to use mark all marketers are going to have to use ai and blockchain all pr people are going to have to use this all business mba people are going to have to use this so how can they prepare for that so i think uh on a foundational aspect they have to look at how they've structured their organization like for so for example at my company yeah we were a digital marketing agency uh but we had three pillars actually. So it's easy to say, oh yeah, design and technology, but we also had strategy because back in the day, that was something the traditional agencies had strategy and they could be really good at design, but they sucked at technology. They sucked for 20 years, <laughs> you know, and even some of them still suck today. Um, it's only through like their acquisitions and, and pain staking, um, ventures that they've you know grown capabilities on the flip side you had a lot of the the digital agencies that were great with technology and great with design but really sucked at strategy you know because they just didn't understand <laughs> strategic concepts so that's how we developed our philosophy you know what our philosophical foundation and how we structured our company so i would recommend to answer your question i'd recommend to uh, owners and and executives of companies to really think about their philosophy of how they've structured their company and they definitely need a technology pillar it's not enough just to say you have an it person right um or you have contract it services to maintain your network no you need someone really driving technology as a pillar in your company to stay on top of techno technological trends and how to take advantage of emerging platforms and technologies that can allow you to create and realize new efficiencies to produce whatever value you're producing in the marketplace. And so, I mean, for there's another aspect of it. For the new people, the colleges, now when, when I was in college, no one was really talking about social media strategy because social media was still new. Facebook was still in its infancy. They, they still didn't, they only really allowed, I think I was there when they only allowed college students and then they eventually opened it up for everybody. So how can colleges do it? Because the colleges don't pivot very well at all. They kind of are stuck way in like 10 to 15 years in the past sometimes. So how can colleges, because I feel like for them to offer I guess, a way to market, hey, look, we we want to be digital first as well. And we want to give students the keys to, we, we, we want to respect the old school strategies because those still work. Like word of mouth, it will always be king because you cannot replace word of mouth, that type of stuff. But how can they bridge that gap? Because like I said, when I was there, they didn't talk about any of that stuff. They They kind of just, yeah, social media, figure it out. Yeah, so that's a great question. And that was my experience too. So I went to college from 89 to um, 
1993. <laughs> I got to rewind, dating myself here. And I had the same experience where, um, you know, I was a business major and there was a, a variety of, of technology driven business courses. And then you would go into like maybe the um, MIS, Management Information Systems, and CIS, Computer Information System classes as part of your curriculum. And you had to learn some things, but yeah, it was like 10 to 15 years back, just like you said. Um, not once did I hear anything about the internet at that time, and the internet was just being created and, until I was actually working for two professors on campus, and they would travel all over the country doing what they do. And uh, we had email, and I was like, wow, I can communicate with them instantly no matter where they're at. This is amazing. Yeah, you because know, it was the internet. That was my first exposure to the internet, and then um, and then starting to read about it in, in uh, like a web browser and and some catalogs that they had me always ordering from, but I never had a course that mentioned you know the technology and how the internet was going to work and how it was going to evolve. The, the university was easy 10, 15 years behind. So I think the university system is highly challenged today to compete with producing value for its students because someone who is disciplined has some passion and they have a desire to improve their situation, can get online, teach themselves a ton of different topics and, and really develop expertise with a set of skills and, and to bring value to the market. When I hired a lot of people um, at my company, some had college degrees, but some didn't. And for me, the college degree showed, okay, they have a level of discipline that they can finish what they start. Great. And there might've been some other aspects of that experience. Cool. Right. Great. But uh, with like designers and programmers, especially, it was like, show me, show me what you can do. Let me see your work that you've done. Take this test, sit here for an hour, and here's what I want you to do. Now do it. Let's see what you got. And we hired a lot of people that didn't have college educations. They were self-taught, and they did awesome. They're great. And then we had others that were formally taught, and they did great too. But I think so. I think the universities really need to evolve and somehow – get like some innovation lab centers to where they're really see, really focused on what's happening in the marketplace and somehow work that into the curriculum much faster than they have in the past. Because yeah, I think I'm older than you and that was my experience. And then you had your experience, which seemed to be echo the same experience I had. So is that still the same experience today? <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. And now they're charging people tons of money to attend these universities where you become de a debt slave coming out of school after a quarter of a million dollars of, of attending the university where, you know, a lot of people can just learn stuff on their own. Not every profession, you know, doctors and things like that. That's, that's different. Right. But, um, for a business, you know, people can learn a lot on their own. Yeah. I mean, you have like Eugenemy and all those other, online courses that you can take and they're they're a fraction of oh, way more than a fraction they're like like one percent even that of the cost so i mean that's gonna that's gonna be the college's thing and so let's say they went through college like how how can how can the college students like just learn on their own because i know it's challenging but and i'm probably going to be talking about more of the graduating college students because they will have a little bit more time on how to learn from themselves but how can they like gain that skill and be ahead of the curve because being ahead of the curve will give you i guess leverage a little bit more than being where you're at right now where social media and ads which ads are going through a tremendous time digital ads because you got the iPhones, like new privacy things, and you got the destruction of cookies eventually from Google. So how can they like maintain that market advantage when they're graduating? Because you want to find a job and you want to find a job as quickly as possible, usually. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I believe that people need to take it upon themselves to make sure they're studying their industry and their industry trends. And how do they do that? They go about that by getting online because 
you know, the old days of going to the bookstore and getting magazines is um, done. It's too old. The information is too old, right? Um, that's just more for recreation, but for like serious study and work and finding out what's new, brand new, you got to jump online. And what are the associations in the industry that you're um, looking at? What kind of events do they have? Also, what are the different online publications, uh, media outlets that are very specific to that industry that are pumping out news and information that is highly timely, you know, covering the newest breakthroughs. They, they really, once college is done, the learning doesn't stop. Yeah, that's just the beginning. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really upon them to study. It was one of the interview questions we asked people. So how do you stay current? Um, with your skills, what 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 kind of publications do you read? What what do you attend? What do you do on your own to keep up on the latest trends? So it's it's really up to each individual to be very proactive and get online and and soak it up. Yeah, I mean, like for me, like podcasting. There's Pod News that just does only news on podcasting. That's how I keep up to take yeah. going on because because google they're a great company but they change so many times and they have so many confusing strategies a lot of time like google podcast apple music or youtube music now we're gonna the google podcast right. is gonna go away in april now we have youtube music now you gotta make sure that your podcast is on youtube music because it's not well google podcast isn't gonna do anything for you because it's gonna go away so yeah i mean it's a lot to to take in just just for one industry now i try to keep ahead of the curve or at least understand like the marketing industry too because obviously i'm doing a podcast for marketing so i gotta at least know but that is the one thing that the college did teach me in my pr classes learn and like figure out a way to keep on top of the relevant trends in your industry so i, I agree with you on that like that is probably your lifelong goal is to figure out a way to keep on top of the all the industry that's going on yeah, yeah, because the world of business, which ex extends to all fields, right? Because everything's driven by business at the end of the day. The world of business is highly dynamic, is constantly changing and evolving. So, yeah, once your education is done, you 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 still have to um, continue. Even let's say something that's um, very hands on, like say. Um, um, physical therapists or people that study kinesiology. I'm going to mispronounce the. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, and uh, they go like sports trainers and chiropractors. And there's something that's been around for a long time, but there's all of this new technology and, and devices that are coming out that enables them to work in new ways and to have more effective, effectiveness especially like working with like high performing athletes. I've seen some of these devices that are out there that are, are you know, breakthrough technologies. That's you know, amazing. Um, and how are you going to stay up on that? If um, you're not proactive with it, you're going to rely on your employer. What if your employer isn't staying up on that? Right. You stay up on it yourself. You, you make yourself more marketable out there because now you have skills and you can uh, go to uh, a place that has needs and say, Hey, this is what I know. I can bring value um, because I, I have this skill and this added knowledge of this cutting edge uh, development out there. Uh, brings me to the next question. Cause when I was doing marketing a few times, I'd be ahead of the curve and then I scare people. Cause I was like, well, you need to do this, 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 cause your website's behind. And these are the new protocols or the protocols that are eventually in a few months going to be mandatory. And all of a sudden they're like, Whoa, like, so how do you ease them in? Because I had to learn how to ease people in and not like, like, I guess, digital verbal throw up on them and be like, oh, I, I don't know what to do. This is too much and I'm out. Right. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, different organizations at different stages with their, their size and their industry. Some are very fast moving or are willing to adopt new technologies and trends. Others are very slow moving um, and just because of the nature of their business. So that's one thing. And then the size, you know, smaller companies are able to be more nimble and adopt. But I think what you have, what one has to do is show value, like prove value. Like what's the use case? Are there any case studies that 
um, of a similar company, similar situation where they've adopted this technology and the results that produced, like was, did they realize efficiencies? So they saved money, so they were able to be more profitable or were they able to reach new markets, uh, expand their reach and uh, create uh, additional revenue because of this technology? Both perhaps uh, reaching more, maybe more effectiveness and response and at a less cost. For example, I'm going to go back, you know, rewind before email marketing really started to catch hold. That was uh, something that we were always contending with because we were a, a reseller for uh, what was called at the time exact target, which was a major email marketing provider service provider that eventually got acquired by salesforce.com. So we're a reseller of that platform. And we had to show the value of why email marketing can uh, really help drive uh, revenue and help save costs compared to their direct mail. Um, so in some cases, uh, we were showing people how they could get rid of their printed newsletter or drastically reduce their printed newsletter and bring people over to their email newsletter and save a ton of money and still um, reach those people and get all the analytics on what was actively act, actually resonating with their audience, which was all, you know all kinds of additional value there as well. Yeah, and so what do you think the future is going to look like for digital transformation? I mean, I know it briefly, I just briefly mentioned the Apple Vision Pro coming out. Even mm -hmm. though it's super expensive right now, it's like the first yeah. com Apple computer. That was super expensive. I mean, you had the famous 1984 ad campaign on the Super Bowl, which yes. Super Bowl was just on. So like, where where is this digital transformation going? Are we going to see more VR, professional VR units? Because right now it's just gaming and gaming, it's not really taking off very well still. They're cheap, they're cheaper, but there's, there's really, I'm not even like convinced about the use cases, even though VR is not new. It's, it was made in like the 90s and I used it once in the 90s in a mall playing a game and I was like, this is awful. And so yeah. where are we going to go with this? Are we going to see like people, like I saw a video of someone using Apple Vision Pro in a, in, in a subway and you saw him like move his head and like look like working. Are we going to see that dystopian future where no one's going to actually <laughs> look at each other anymore and we're just going to be looking at screens? Are we going to get right. more interesting use cases for technology for like advertising to people like where is this all going yeah yeah um god i hope it doesn't go to that dystopian future <laughs> that's a perfect word for it uh it's funny because you see a lot of this angling of oh yeah the consumer the end consumer wearing these devices and you know going you know walking around and you know all, all this stuff like the where I think there's uh, low hanging fruit though, actually for that technology is in a uh, highly technical professional environment. So I was just speaking with someone a week ago or so who does car design, uh, automotive design, and there he's utilizing VR technology to actually help teach other designers on, on car design using some AI tools as well and VR combined with other platforms, uh, just a, a new way to go through the design process that is uh, very efficient, highly productive. And he's working with people uh, from all over the world and they're meeting in a virtual environment with the headsets on and, and really going at it. So that that's like a, a, a case where there's true value to that technology and experience. Um, where it's effective. So I think uh, in very specialized industrial type applications, that's where it could actually thrive. Um, the consumer stuff, yeah, I, I think uh, like you, like me, I think there's a lot of people out there that just don't want to see all of us walking around with these headsets on and not you know paying attention to each other. I think what could happen is as holograms become much more um, viable. Yeah, well, I've, I've seen them at CES and like, wow, that's amazing. That thing's just floating in the air right in front of me and it looks pretty awesome. Wow, that's cool. 
uh, when we have wearable devices that are projecting holograms that um, are very crisp, vibrant, and possibly maybe even responsive to how our fingers react with those photons or light molecules, however that would be registered, that could be very interesting. And I could see that's where um, more of that consumer marketplace could really take off. But that's a ways out. I think the headset VR thing, there's... Uh, I don't, I don't think we want to be jacked into the matrix, even though we, we kind of are, but, you know, to turn off. I agree with you, but people listening to this episode are like, where can I, where can I find Craig online to learn more about what is does any your book as well? Oh, great. Thank you. So, uh, yes, um, my website's my primary, um, point of contact. So that is c squared pro.io. So that's the letter C and then squared pro.io. Um, there is a page on there for my book. People can learn about uh, what I call the five elements of entrepreneurship. And it's in the first chapter. So people can download that first chapter for free. And if they like, they get value out of the book, hopefully they do. Uh, they could go to Amazon and purchase it on Amazon. It's in uh, paperback hardcover and Kindle format. I'll probably be releasing it, uh, releasing it in other channels uh, later in the year, but that's where people can get it at the moment. And then connecting with me on LinkedIn is another good source. I, I actively monitor LinkedIn. I'm on social, other social channels too, Instagram and Twitter as Craig Cook, um, TikTok as C-squared.777. But uh, my website and LinkedIn are uh, the two that I monitor the most closely and best way to contact me. All right. Thank you, Craig, for joining Digital Coffee Marketing Brew and sharing your knowledge on digital transformation. Thank you, Brett. And thank you, as always. Please subscribe to Digital Coffee and all your favorite podcasts and have some five-star review really does help. And join us next week as we're talking to Craig Ballard in the PR marketing stream. All right, guys, stay safe. Get to understanding your digital transformation for your business or for yourself as well. And see you next week. Later. <laughs>